I'm gonna to say something a little bit different. Uh, so this is my title: it's relational structure knowledge in human brains, and I'm gonna to uh, uh, introduce how the relational structure knowledge is represented, it's memorized, and it's learned in the human brain. So because the background uh, of the audience is quite general, so I'm gonna to give a very overall picture of the questions we are interested in, why we're interested in that, the experiments we have done, the results we, we have found, and what, um, what do these results mean in a very, how to say, overall picture, uh, while ignoring many details, okay? Um, yeah, so this is what I'm going to cover. Okay, I think we all agree that we are living in an era of data explosion. Since 21st century, especially I think given the COVID-19 pandemics, we have almost we have made most of our life online online right now, right? And we communicate with each other using data. We get to know what happens around this world by data. And we express we express our opinions in data as we we're currently doing right now. So we're really in, uh, living in an era of data explosion. Uh, so for example, as shown in this graph, we have set, sent 2.9 million emails per second, and we uploaded 20 hours video to YouTube every minute. And we do 50 million tweets per day. I, be, I don't have the number for WeChat, I believe should be a tremendous number. And we also buy 73 items per second on Amazon. I believe we will have a high number in our uh, Taobao, right? So yeah, so the data is tremendous amount of that. Um, and data explosion will naturally, unsurprisingly, also bring about information explosion. Uh, we are living in a time that in principle, we could have, um, we don't have limitation to access all the information through the whole human history and also the natural universe if we choose and if we want at any time, even using a small cell phone. And uh, certainly as a consequence, the data explosion and information explosion will also result in knowledge explosion. This is just a, a graph I find online to showing the number of articles uploaded to our uh, archive for different disciplines and category within the 30 years. Okay, you can see almost all the disciplines just have exponential increase for the paper publication. So I think uh, as a scientist or research at the current time, it's just impossible for us to read all the papers, even your most relevant area, because it's just impossible. There are so many, many papers. That's why we choose to attend conferences to see, to listen to others talk. Since the talk, we all kind of compress all the papers within one hour and we know what they mean, right? Because we don't have time and energy to just consume everything. And so that is knowledge explosion. Okay, so on the one hand, the technology, the data, the information, and the knowledge create a tremendous possibility for, for we human beings to learn more and know more if we choose to do that. But on the, on the other hand, they also give us so much pressure, uh, I think, in both mental and also in physical, because we know that we have limitless accessibility to all the information, but it's just uh, impossible for us to you know, do our job and finish everything. And because, because from psychology view, information explosion on the other hand poses a tremendous challenge to our cognitive system and in principle to our brain. For example, we know that we have attentional bottle, bottleneck and we cannot attend to many things simultaneously, right? Because now if you want to really focus on what I'm, I'm, I'm I'm saying you cannot attend to other things, right? Otherwise you will just get lost. So we have attentional bottleneck. That's why uh, you'd better not, you know, think about very hard questions or talking with your friends when you drive the car, right? That's very dangerous. And that's prohibited in some countries. 
And we also have uh, limitations of our working memory capacities. And we cannot memorize, memorize, I think, above seven items simultaneously. That's why you'd better not to do that. Keep in mind, like for eight or 10 things, because you certainly will forget that. You will have an excuse that I forget that. Okay, so this is our, our cognitive load. And that is our some, something that limits our ability. And the information explosion actually contradict our cognitive limitation. Um, right. So the information explosion has another problem. I think also make us a little bit frustrated. That is the information fragmentation. I believe everybody will encounter that in the current world. Uh, let me cite an example. For example, if this is just a, a lot of random, unconnected, meaningless puzzle pieces as here, we could regard it as information explosion or information fragmentation, right? But if, if you know that all of the puzzles actually coming from a unified picture and they are connected with each other, and there are some hidden structures that organize all these puzzle pieces, then these are not information fragmentation and this is not information explosion. We actually could make sense of all this meaningless, unrelated, fragmented information. So we really need to figure out the underlying structure or rule of all this, um, all uh, th this tremendous amounts of information. And, and so if you know the rule, then that could alleviate cognitive load, as I mentioned previously, because a cognitive load, just to tell you, you cannot handle so much things, but you, if you have some underlying organization principle that could alleviate your cognitive load as a puzzle here. So now it's not just a 20 puzzles, but a unified picture. And you, you, you only need to know, okay, where is the location that the puzzles is on? Then you know the whole picture. So that will alleviate cognitive load and make you better understand, uh, understand the information. Um, in addition to alleviate our cognitive load, we also know that the fragmented information will also make us very confused and there are so much dispute over the same thing. And there is a very, uh, I think, old story from Chinese um, Asian history that's called a blind touching elephant, okay? So everybody just have their own perspective for one part of the same thing, okay? Uh, Right, so some of the saying, this is just a snake, this is a spear, this is a fan, because it just a touch part of the elephant. And to make all the fragmented together unified, we need to have some rule to organize them. So this, uh, this, uh, this hidden structure could also help us not only alleviate our cognitive load, but also help us to better understand the universe. So let me summarize, I think data it's not information. Information is not knowledge. Knowledge is not understanding and understanding is not wisdom. That's a quote. And I have shown, uh, so how could we get knowledge from data? That's a very important question. Um, so I find some graph which has done a very great job to illustrate this, this concept. So what is the data? Data is kind of a random sampling of the external world, right? Uh, and also uh, random sampling of the things we human beings have produced. But they are meaningless, they are fragmented, and there are a lot of that. And what is information? So information is kind of using a statistic or an analytic approaches to make sense of the data. For example, give them some categories or labels. Okay, So we know that many data are redundant. They just uh, random sampling the same thing. That is information. And what is knowledge? I think knowledge is, uh, is some kind of uh, hidden structure that connecting those information. So now we will make sense of the information because we know there are some unified structure behind them. And there is a, a very famous saying, connecting the dots. Yes, I think that's a very good, uh, that's a very good uh, metaphor. Knowledge is kind of connecting the facts. The knowledge might be regarded as the lies um, or the rule of the lies to connect this knowledge. Okay, so uh, 
As I as I said before, I think knowledge relies on structured organization of the fragmented input. So we will figure out what is the underlying lines and what is the underlying structure uh, for those uh, fragmented information. And uh, I'm going to give a very uh, specific definition about structure. Structure actually denotes the relationship between items. So that's the lies, in, regardless of the item themselves. For example, the green could be replaced by red, that's okay. But we want to know the, the underlying structure. So structural information will be a more a stationary or constant thing. But still, structure is quite, um, it's a very abstract concept. So I would like to show you some examples, especially from cognitive psychology uh, related uh, what's the structure. Um, for example, in human perception, there has been, um, it has been long known that a guest child principle will organize the external information to guide our perceptual perception. So what is a guest child principle? It, it's actually a set of principles, but let's uh, first uh, look at this figure. So this example uh, introduced a proximity uh, principle. Um, so there are eight squares, right? But at the first glance, you will not see eight squares. You will automatically divide the eight squares into two rows, right? Because you already uh, make use of the proximity principle to just uh, group these four upper squares because they are more proximated to each other as one object and group the another four squares into another object. And that will alleviate your cognitive load. Instead of, you know, saying A squares, now you have two whole objects, right? So that is a proximity principle. And there is a, another one which is famous, it's called similarity principle. So we try to group things that are more similar to each other as one object. So you, you can see a diagonal and the background and also connection principle. So you tend to perceive the items that are connected to each other as a group or continuity principle. So although they are fragmented lines, but you will connect lines using the continuity principle. Also we human beings like symmetry principle, like figure ground principle. So you either see this walls or the background face and you cannot see them simultaneously. So that's another uh, structure organization principle, right? So there are many, many guest house principle and they are saying some structure because proximity is some kind of structure. And you, based on this principle, extract the structure. And similarity is also structure. So that's one example of what the structure means. Another example is that even for the same contents, we can apply different structures to different uh, to the same contents, uh, resulting different, totally different things. Okay. For example, here we see the contents are just a, a small boy and a car. So the content is exactly the same: car and boy. But we can use different structures to be imposed on them. Uh, for example, if we think about inside outside structure, we can have two different pictures. The boy could be within the car or the boy could be outside of the car, right? So the same content by different structure, you will have different combination. The same principle, for example, large and small. So the boy could be in the car or the car is just a toy car and it's hold by this boy. So same um, content could be organized by different structures resulting in different combinations. Okay, and so on and so on. So today I'm going to uh, present three lines of the experiment my lab has done. So uh, I come from the School of Psychology and Cognitive Science. We're using some, uh, you know, uh, cognitive behavior experiments. We also could record brain activities when subjects are doing some task, and we can do some data analysis on their brain data and show how this has been done. Okay, so this is uh, three works I'm trying to present today, and they are all related with relational structure knowledge and how they are represented in working memory, how they are learned, and what's the difference between different relational structures. So the first part is dissociate structure of content 
and structure in working memory. And that's mainly done by my PhD student, Fan Ying. Okay. So before I present the results, let me first illustrate this concept. Uh, what is a dissociation of con content structure? Think about we can combine content structure in numerous, in numerous ways, but that will also bring a problem. That's combinational exploding, right? If you have two structures and two count, then you need four, four cells in principle to represent four combinations, right? But if you factorize a content structure, then you only need two because you can separate them together. You have one neuron group to code content, and you have another neuron group to show to represent structure. Okay, they are separated, they are encoded or represented in a disentangled manner. Then you can combine them later, which could still bring neurons combination. So that gives us more flexibility and also at the same time. Uh, could alleviate the neuron representation, you know, limitation, uh, right? So this is a content structure a dissociation um, concept. And, and here we are focusing on sequence structure because that's a very easy and, and fundamental structure. Uh, so what is sequence structure? Sequence structure is just a sequence. So each item will be allocated to certain uh, ordinal position within the sequence. Sequence structure is quite fundamental in our everyday life. For example, if you want to make a phone call to your friends, not only you need to memorize 10 digits, but also so important, you need to remember their ordinal position in the sequence, right? Otherwise you cannot reach your friend. The similar thing for the melody, right? Uh, we Everybody have their favorite song, but if you cannot remember the ordinal position of those notes, Probably this song just doesn't make sense. The same thing for your gesture movement. You need to produce a time series to tra trajectory of the movement. And what is a working memory? I'm just briefly introduced. So working memory is some ability to temporarily maintain information in your mind, right? So for example, uh, as, I, as I'm giving my talk, you probably there are something in your working memory. Uh, but you cannot hold that for so long. You need, you need to be consolidated to other things. Otherwise, maybe after several minutes, you will forget. Okay. So in a typical working memory experiment, there will be three periods. The first period is encoding period. So we will present you something to remember. Okay. Then during this maintaining period, the things to be memorized will disappear and you need to maintain the information in your mind, maybe for several seconds, just a second, okay? It's not like for a long time. And then after that, we will ask you to recall the information that you're instructed to memorize. That's the three periods. And we're particularly interested in this maintaining period because here you don't see anything, but the thing certainly has been kept in your mind. And so that's a very interesting period that you can examine how brain stores the information that is not there anymore, okay? Um, so here are the experiments. Um, we recruit 30 human subjects and we ask them to wear the EEG cap so that their brain activities will be recorded simultaneously when they do this auditory sequence working memory task. And during this encoding period for each trial, they will be presented with a tone sequence. So the sequence will consist three pure tones and their pitches are different and their pitches will be randomly selected from six possible frequencies like D, 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 like those, those type of stuff. And so we call content of this tone is a frequency they are associated, okay? That's the definition of content here. So what's the structure of these tones? The structure is an ordinal position of these tones within the sequence. Okay, so the, the tone could be the first or the second or the third. That's what we call structure. So first, let's look at our, how our brain represents the tones. So we recorded the brain signals and we can do some neuron decoding. And we find that the brain activities for each tone will carry two codes in parallel. One is to represent our content, so the pitch of the tones. Another one is the structure. So um, the ordinal position in the sequence, sequence of this tone. So this has already suggested that content structure might be represented or encoded in a dissociated way, even during this encoding period. 
Then what about the maintaining period when we human beings maintain those information in our working memory? There is a problem that all the cognitive science face because when information come into this maintaining period, if you just look at the brain signal, it will enter an activity silent period, okay? So during this period, although you know that information is representing your brain, but the brain just doesn't show like very prominent sign signature for you to access, right? So how to access information that is silently relate, uh, retained in your brain? We actually use approach which is called impulse res response approach. Let me explain that a little bit because I think that's a very interesting and uh, um, uh, I think uh, intriguing approach. Uh, so the impulse response approach actually borrowed the idea of sonar system. So if you have a system that's holding some information silently, you can actually send impulse to the system. And this impulse will transiently perturb the system. So information contained in the system could be reactivated. And by reading all those uh, reactivation, you know, okay, what kind of information is hidden in your brain? So that's the impulse response approach. To make you, make you more uh, clear about this concept, I find a video I think can, can, good, um, can, did a good, uh, can, can, can do a good job to illustrate this idea. That's from Tom and Jerry. Okay, so think about uh, the piano is a working memory system, okay? And it's silent. And Jerry is some information that is hidden in this piano, okay? But he just uh, silently, you know, hide there. And so you don't know whether Jerry is there. So what you can do? So what Tom can do is give a huge punch to the piano. That's like impulse, okay? So he give a huge punch to the piano and Jerry who is hidden in this piano will be reactivated. That's the idea of the impulse response approach. <laughs> Okay, and so if Jerry is not hidden there, even you give a huge punch, you cannot reactivate anything. And only Jerry is there, can you punch him out? So, so this is the impulse response, uh, response approach we applied here. During this maintaining period, we'll present two triggering events. That's like Tom, that's like the huge punch to the piano. And we try to see whether this uh, triggering event could reactivate either content information or structured information from your memory system. Uh, I will just ignore some detail, but let's say the first triggering event will reactivate structured information, but not content information. Well, the second triggering event, which is just a pure white noise, it will reactivate content information, but not structured information. So this has already suggested that content structure are stored in a dissociated way in working memory. Uh, moreover, we also examine their coding dynamics. We show that content seems to have a dynamic in nature. So the coding characteristic changes over time. Well, the structure seems to be keep stable. So this is another thing that content and structure are represented in a dissociated way. So uh, in summary of this part, how do you memorize a tone sequence, an auditory sequence, or a music melody? Instead, your brain try to separate the content structure together. So you know the pitch and then their ordinal position within the sequence structure. And you uh, dissociate them um, and maintain them in your working memory. Okay, so this is so far um, the, the take home message for the first part. Now I'm gonna to, uh, introduce the second project that's a learning network structure. And this is mainly done by my postdoc, Xiang Juanren, and also it's a collaboration, a collaboration work with my colleague, Professor Zhang Hang, also from School of Psychological and Cognitive Sciences. Uh, in the first part, we have started the sequence structure. But in a sequence structure, you could be regarded as a very simple one-dimensional you know, uh, structure. That's very simple. But item and item, the relationship between item, item is not only like one line, one dimensional connected. And they could also be connected using other complex structures. For example, they can form a ring, a mesh, a hierarchical tree, a star shape, or some network. So network is something we're interested in and try to start it. 
if you look at the social network, right, if you just quantify the relationship between different persons around the world, you can get a social network. From this network, you know, you can figure out some online structure. Similarly, if you look at all the words around this world and trying to figure out their statistic relationship in terms of, you know, the articles, the novels, or the tweets, you could also build a semantic network. So all the network could also uh, uh, represent the, under, the, the underlying structure, right, behind those fragmented information. So this is what we are interested in. And uh, okay, so this part is a little bit hard, but uh, I will try my best to tell you what we do. So we design a probabilistic sequential prediction task. What is that? So for every subject, you are first to show, you are presented with one image. That's just an arbitrary image, okay? And you need to make a guess. What's the next one? What's the next image that follow this image with a you know, higher probability? Of course, you don't know, but we will give you feedback. So we will show two pictures and you just choose one and we will let you know, okay, it's correct or wrong. And after several trials, you will, you will figure out what's the next one. Okay, that's it. So through a learning by feedback. So this is just a proper uh, sequential prediction task. You are showing one picture and you guess what's the next one. Okay, that's the next one. Based on the next one, okay, you guess what's the next one. Okay, you do that again, 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 then you can figure out a lot of, uh, you know, image sequence and the probabilistic uh, prediction uh, among them. So you kind of have a chain linking those uh, images. Okay, that's a sequential prediction task. And so we actually have 50 images together and the subjects are learning the images transitional relationships through the feedback. I try to, try to emphasize that uh, subjects only see they, they didn't see the relationship between. They need to learn and figure out the relationship between these items, right? So these items are just presented to the subject in a fragmented way, but you need to link them together. That's the basic idea. So I'm going to uh, ignore this detail. This is experiment detail. So how we do the experiment, okay? Basically, they just uh, have an image and choose a target image and then choose the next image and choose the next image. But still, um, just for fun, I will give you a demo. That's just a recording of the real experiment, okay? It's called, uh, you know, coin prediction task because they will give feedback by using coins, right? So they can understand. Let's see, okay. So first subjects will show in one image and there are two images. You need to choose the one, okay? So this one is the best one. Okay, this is a target. And this is a target. And this is a target. So after many trials, subjects should make response before the feedback because they already know the answer. And at the beginning, we will give them feedback so that they know which is the right one. That's it, okay. And, but you will think about, okay, so go back to the content and structure dissociation. So this is a content. Content is just the 15, you know, meaningless images, right? But what is structure? I haven't told you, but now let's uh, tell you the answer. What's the relational structure of the image set? It's actually a network, which is unbeknown to the subject. So subject never see this network. It's just a hiddenly, you know, designed in their statistical transitional relationship. So each node of this network represent one image, okay? And lines connecting those uh, two nodes means a transitional probability relationship between these two images. So for example, for this image, that will be connected to four images. And so they have 0.25 uh, probability to be transmitted to either this one or this one or this one or this one, okay? And you can also see that it comprise a community structure. So there are three clusters and that's, that's how they are related to each other. But I want to emphasize again, subjects never see this network. They need to figure out, okay. So the first thing we try to see uh, also, I think important for different subjects, the combination between the image and the network is randomized. So they kind of see the same content. They see the same, con uh, they, they, they learn the same structure, but the combination between image and the 
uh, structure are different across subjects, right? So they are not learning the same image sequence, although the content is structured the same. Mm, so basically the, the sequence, the subjects are presented is a pass, right? Spanning the network. That's what it means. And so the relationship between images are totally determined by the transitional probability defining this relational network. Let's first see what the subjects could learn, okay? This is totally beyond their uh, working memory ability or attentional ability because there's already 15 images. But how could we know whether they have figured out the relationship? Let's just look at their prediction performance. If you can predict well before the feedback, then that just means, okay, they have learned the relational structure. And that's what we find. So you can see, um, this is just some behavior uh, environments, like their reaction time, their behavior accuracy, et cetera. And you can see after, um, after several training, okay, subjects' performance become gradually increased, right? This suggested that, yes, they have learned the transitional network beyond those fragmented uh, image sequences. But most interestingly, we're trying to see what they're, how, how, do, how do their brain do, right? Could, could we find something uh, about this relational structure in their brain? This is a little bit complicated, but I, I will try my best to explain that. So uh, we can actually first uh, develop a design matrix. The design matrix will quantify the relationship between all these image pairs. And that's what we call transitional probability relationship. And this design matrix actually denotes the relationship between all these 15 images, okay? So that's kind of our you know, golden rule. That's something we're looking for in our brain. And then in the brain activities, we can try to find some you know, regression between the design matrix and our neural signals. If there are, then that means our brain could also represent these 15 images like uh, the relationship categorized in this matrix, okay? And we, we indeed find it. So we, you can see that when subjects are presented with the image, just after uh, 800 milliseconds, 800 milliseconds, so within one second, you, their brain signals will emerge some neural signature that just categorize their relationship. So they suggested that your brain automatically calculate the image's relationship, right? This is neural signal, this is not behavior. And we have also tried to just confirm the results. We also uh, see other things, whether they could also uh, account for this neural signature. For example, their luminance, uh, their node category, and they cannot, only this relational network can show the same. And we also see that the neural signature of the relational structure further correlates with their behavior. So the higher the neural signature of the relational structure is, the faster and uh, better their prediction performance is. So this just uh, indicate a causal link between them. Uh, finally, um, there's another thing which I don't want to get into more detail, but uh, briefly say, we also find that um, subjects have ability to infer from this transitional network and from that emerge a higher order relational network. So what does high order relational network means? It means a cluster, the distance within the cluster will be shortened. The distance between clusters will be larger. So it's kind of a divergence of cluster, although that's not uh, you know, encoded in the physical relational network because for the physical network, you can see the within cluster distance and between cluster distance is the same, it's all one, it's all uh, 0.25 transitional probability. But by using some computational modeling and neural data analysis, we show that uh, the within cluster distance will be compressed in your brain activation. And the between cluster distance will be enlarged. That's another, I think, interesting finding. So um, summarizing this one, um, we also show that content, of how do you remember, how do you learn uh, image sequences, right? So we human brain actually also separate content structure content are just those image sets. And we are also automatically computing their transitional relationship. Here it's a network structure, right? And also from this network structure, we can infer the high order new structure that is a compressing within cluster and enlarging between cluster distance. Okay, so the final project I tried to, finally, final project I tried to present is also done by uh, 
and postdoc uh, Xiang Juan, and also that's a collaboration project with uh, uh, Li Aming. So he's also a professor at School of uh, Think Engineering from Peking University. So, uh, so in this lab, we, we just uh, follow uh, the second project. We have show you like subjects are good at figuring out the network structure behind a major sequence. And in this one, we try to compare in different network structures. So instead of using this community network, we will choose other networks. So here we choose lattice network, random network, small world network, and scale-free network. And we, why we choose this, um, this is also suggestion by Professor Liami because he's working on networks theory. You know, the networks theory um, um, uh, recently, I think uh, Nobel Prize also uh, the topic uh, is related to this topic. But in any way, the lattice random small and scale-free network here, we have uh, designed them in a very careful way. For example, all these four networks have the same number of nodes, right? Or are 16 nodes. And also the average degree of freedom. So means the average uh, connection for each node is around four. So the four networks are comparable uh, in many parameters, but the only different thing between the four network is their structure, okay? And so we did the same thing, right? So we have content uh, here, uh, a 16 images, oh, sorry, I, I put the wrong image, but it's 16 images, okay? And the structures, we have four types of structures, lattice, random, small word, and scale free. And we, we ask the subjects to do the exact the same task as the previous one, but the underlying structure is different. And we have run that on diff four different groups. So uh, a little bit manipulation, but yeah, let, let me show you how we do that. And again, you have one image, and you try to use your mouse to predict the target image. And you have another one, you use a mouse, and you have this one, you use a mouse, so that's it. Okay. So by looking at your prediction, your, your, your prediction across trials, uh, how you learn that, we can, we can get to know which network is much easier to learn or has better learnability, that's it. Uh, okay, so, we have uh, offline experiments and for each group, we have 15 subjects. And this is a uh, results from the four networks. Um, how to see the results? In fact, you should focus on this part because this part is a subject's mouse response before the feedback, right? Before feedback is important. After the feedback, feedback everybody knows the right answer. So that, that is meaningless. So let's look at this one. Uh, and you already can see that they have, the subjects have some prediction ability before the feedback, right? So especially for the scale free, you can see there it's like larger proportion. And even you just compare the images have only no degree of four, it means they are connected to four uh, other images, the same. So by summarizing the these results, we show that if you compare these four networks, scale free is the best one, okay? So scale free relational network shows the best learner performance. And because of the difficulty in running experiments in offline, we also do experiments online. And this is a results for online experiment. And we have 17 subjects per group. And we have show this, we show the same thing. So scale free is the best one. Okay, so to summarize this project, uh, even though you are learning a uh, statistic relation between uh, image sequences, in fact, different relational network structure, even convening the same, exact the same content, they will have different learnability. And we show that the scale-free network outperforms other network structure. So why scale-free? So what's the special thing about scale-free? So here I also find some graph showing on the, on the internet, maybe better characterize it for networks. So the regular network is like the lattice uh, network, that's like just the local connections, okay? It's like our distant Asian world. That's local connection, right? We don't have international, connect, international connection or random connection, right? Randomly connected. And so small world is interesting. Small world is you have regular local connection and some random long range connection, okay? Uh, and then it comes to the scale free now. Scale free now, you have some hub 
right, to connecting some things. So if you look at the power law distribution about the nodes of degree, the scale free shows a very long tail distribution. So it means some hub are very important. And in fact, scale free is kind of a very natural phenomenon in the natural world and also in the world we are living. For example, the travel, traveling network, there will be some uh, hub, for example, New York, Chicago, right? Uh, you know, uh, Seattle, et cetera. And also, if you look at our social network, there are also some hub. So all this network seems to be like scale free. And our uh, results seems to show that scale free, it's a very, how to say, efficient uh, network to organize different information. And so if uh, the information are organized in the scale free network, they're just uh, much easier to learn, okay? Okay, so I hope using this three project, I have convinced you that actually I don't need experiment data to convince you. We all know that our human beings are endowed with tremendous ability to figure out the underlying structure, relational structure behind those uh, you know, fragmented content. And by using those structure to organize the fragmented and the tremendous amounts of data, we can figure out the knowledge and we can stabilize our world and also we can alleviate our cognitive load. So how to get knowledge from data, right? So uh, I hope some of our data and experiments uh, support you. That's what human do, and that's what human brains do. And we have found some neuron relates of how they do that. Uh, but we don't know about AI, right? AI, how, how could AI figure out structure from data? Um, maybe uh, human results could give some hints. So I want to thank especially four person. Fai Yin is a, uh, my PhD student for the auditory sequence working memory, and Xiang Zhen is the main person who did all the experiment about the network structure. And my collaborators, Professor Zhang Han and Professor Li Amin. And thank you, my lab, and thank you, the ground support, and thank you for your attention. Mm.